Hello everyone, it's Jabari here. Today's video is a patron request. If you would like to submit a video request of your own, you can do so by becoming a tier 2 patron or donator. Links to this can be found below in the description. Today's topic is hands down one of my favorite elements of African history, or world history in general. Seafaring or maritime traditions have been an integral part of the lives of several of the world's cultures throughout history. As with most discussions of history, emphasis rests almost exclusively on the history of European, Middle Eastern, and East Asian civilizations. In the case of maritime traditions, the European voyages during the Age of Exploration likely come to mind. Arabs have been sailing throughout the coast of Africa, Asia, Europe, and even as far as Indonesia for several centuries. Even Stone Age peoples of the Polynesian Islands had a very well-developed seafaring tradition that led them to colonize nearly all major island chains of the Pacific Ocean with evidence suggesting that they may have even made it to the Americas. That's pretty impressive, right? The Inca Empire of South America is also known to have had maritime trade relations with the states of pre-Columbian Mexico. However, there is another entire continent that is largely ignored in regards to maritime traditions. Ones that are just as ancient, impressive, and extensive as those found in Europe or Asia. There is a popular belief that Sub-Saharan Africans were restricted to their own continent until the birth of the transatlantic slave trade. Nothing can be farther from the truth. While the seafaring traditions were relatively sparse on the continent compared to their European counterparts, they were not absent, especially when considering that Africa is a much larger continent at approximately four times the size of Europe. For the sake of this video, I'll divide the seafaring traditions of Africans into three distinct regions, North African, West African, and East African. As always, my focus will be on Sub-Saharan Africa, so North Africa will not be discussed in this video, mainly due to the fact that North African seafaring traditions fit more into a unique tricontinental Mediterranean tradition that includes Greeks, Romans, Persians, and Carthaginians. The tradition of boat building in West Africa has a long history. In fact, the oldest boat in West Africa is the Dafuna Canoe discovered in Nigeria in the year 1987 by a local Fulani herdsman. This boat was radiocarbon dated to around 8,000 years old, making it the oldest in Africa and the third oldest in the world. Yep, even older than Egyptian boats. Like much of the continent at the time of European arrival, the indigenous watercraft of West Africa were almost exclusively restricted to vessels such as riverboats and canoes designed to navigate the vast networks of riverways such as the Niger and Senegal river systems. Despite this, several of these boats have been documented reaching sizes in excess of 100 feet in length and occasionally incorporating sails. These boats were commonly used for transport of cargo, trade goods, and personnel throughout the several kingdoms that existed in the region. Many of the states on the West African coast even had their own navies entirely composed of such vessels. Perhaps the most popular documented instance of a West African empire that had boats with ocean-going capabilities can be found in the writings of the Egyptian scholar Alumari, which date back to the 14th century. In one of his texts, he recorded a conversation that he had with the wealthy ruler of the Mali Empire, Mansa Musa, who described how he acquired the throne in what may have been the largest naval fleet in West African history. So Abu Bakr equipped 200 ships filled with men, and the same number equipped with gold, water, and provisions, enough to last them for years. They departed, and a long time passed before anyone came back. Then one ship returned, and we asked the captain what news they brought. He said, yes, O Sultan, we traveled for a long time, until there appeared in the open sea a river with a powerful current. The other ships went on ahead, but when they reached that place, they did not return and no more was seen of them. As for me, I went about at once and did not enter the river. The Sultan got ready 2,000 ships, 1,000 for himself and the men whom he took with him, and 1,000 for water and provisions. He left me to deputies for him and embarked on the Atlantic Ocean with his men. That was the last we saw of him and all those who were with him, and so I became a king in my own right. It is possible that this fleet may have possibly even landed in the Americas, 
According to a 1998 BBC article written by Joanne Baxter, this massive fleet departed from what is now modern-day Gambia and may have landed in present-day Brazil. We was Kangs and the original Americans. Oh, it's the bigot. Could you just, like, hold on a few more seconds while I finish explaining? Thanks. Despite these accounts and documents, no conclusive evidence has been found to prove that such a voyage ever happened or that it arrived in the Americas. Only time will tell. After all, evidence of Viking settlements in the Americas weren't even discovered until the 1960s. Today, many of the locals refuse to speak of this era in their history as they deem it shameful. The abandonment of them by their rulers, in addition to the irresponsibly spent money and resources, is deemed unworthy of respect or praise. They firmly believe that these resources could have been better spent improving their own empire rather than wasting it all on lavish hajjes and absurdly large fleets. Despite West Africa's largely mysterious and ambiguous seafaring history, other parts of Africa have much more rich and well-known traditions. East African kingdoms and states have an ancient and extensive seafaring tradition that tie them to lands as far away as Arabia, India, and China. These include sites such as Zanzibar, Kilwa, Mombasa, Malindi, Getty, and Great Zimbabwe. While Europeans were still debating whether or not Marco Polo was the first person to actually visit China, East Africans already had a firmly established and complex network of trade relations with them several centuries prior. You n****s are always comparing yourselves to us white men. This isn't done to show whether Europe or Africa is better or worse. It's really done as a mere way of comparing something unfamiliar to something that is familiar. It's no different than saying medieval Japan even though the term medieval itself is a term used to denote a specific period in European history, also known as Middle Ages. Anyway, for those that are open-minded enough to be receptive of new knowledge, it has been backed up by countless archaeological and written sources. According to PBS, as early as the 2nd century CE, large port cities dotted the East African coast, stretching from Kenya to Tanzania, where they navigated the waters trading with Arabs, Indians, and Chinese. These states grew wealthy as they served as middlemen between the interior of Africa and the rest of the Indian Ocean world. Their main exports consisted of gold, ivory, iron, and slaves, which they primarily obtained from the inland kingdom of Zimbabwe, while their imports consisted of luxury goods such as silk and porcelain. They probably learned all of that stuff from Arabs. Yeah, it's funny for people to make such blind assumptions like those without any sources whatsoever. Yet they are so quick to criticize or reject well-documented and factual information when it pertains to Africans actually achieving something. The Swahili culture and language may seem as a mere offshoot of Arabian culture, but in reality, it is a unique creation simply containing borrowed elements. The Arabic influence is quite obviously a key ingredient to Swahili culture, but that does not make Swahili culture any less African. If that were the case, one would have to classify the Japanese as Chinese, or Arabs themselves as Greeks or Romans, as these cultures continuously borrowed from one another, blending their own cultural elements together. This is a pattern that has been seen all around the world throughout history. Swahili culture is an African culture with its own unique African elements mixed in with those borrowed from people that they traded with. The Swahili language, for example, despite the fact that it contains several loan words from Arabic and Hindi, it is still an African Bantu language and was used as a lingua franca in many ports throughout the Indian Ocean. This is a relic of the ancient and well-developed seafaring traditions of the Swahili people. Contrary to popular belief, the vessels in which Swahili traders used in order to sail these seas were not Arabic dhows. They had various types of ships, all collectively known as mtepes. Though the origin of these ships are unknown, they are similar to Arabic dhows and thus are believed to share a common and ancient origin. Their construction and use, however, was unique to the Swahili people, not Arabs. The majority of these vessels were constructed in the Lamu Archipelago, off the coast of modern-day Kenya. The Mtepe was used for anything from fishing to trading and varied in size from 40 to 75 feet in length, with crews that consisted of 20 men on average. The Mtepe were known for being very swift and agile ships, easily able to outsprint their Dao counterparts. They were also known for their remarkable durability. The secret to this durability rested in their construction. Unlike the rigid ships of Europe or Asia, the Mtepe were constructed by binding planks of wood together with woven coconut fiber lashings called coir. 
This was a result of the many coral reefs that existed throughout the Indian Ocean, which posed a grave danger to rigid ships that were held together with nails. On the other hand, the sewn boat construction of the Mtepe allowed for greater flexibility on these reefs, reducing the chances of fracturing or breaking. These coral reefs were so prevalent that in some cases, entire Swahili cities would be constructed out of it, such as the case with the city of Kilwa. This well-developed trade was so firmly established that one would find royal families of East African states wearing silk clothing while dining with porcelain plates imported across the Indian Ocean from China. This is evidenced by Chinese Ming Dynasty era artifacts excavated from sites such as the Gedi ruins of modern day Kenya, and even places as far inland as the Great Zimbabwe ruins. That's bullshit. They probably got there from the Chinese who sailed there and probably conquered and enslaved those blacks. Well, of course, that would be the easy assumption, but unfortunately for those of you who think that way, the Chinese themselves actually documented these encounters in both writing and art. Perhaps the most famous case of this was an instance in 1415, where a Chinese ambassador encountered a group of Swahili traders in the Indian town of Bengal. These traders were delivering giraffes in which the Chinese had never seen before. As a gift, the Swahili traders gave one to the Chinese sailors who then shipped it back to Beijing. A year later, the Swahili merchant shipped yet another giraffe to the royal court of the Ming Dynasty, straight from Malindi, along with a zebra and an oryx. The Chinese emperor commissioned a painting of the second giraffe, which was created by a local painter by the name of Xin Du, who likened it to a mythical beast from Chinese mythology, which they referred to as a Qilin. This is evidenced by the spots being replaced with a pattern that resembles the scales of a fish. These were but a few of several voyages made by Swahili sailors in which they shipped exotic African animals to their Chinese trading partners. Eventually, the trade between the Swahili and the Chinese ended abruptly in the year 1433, after China entered one of its many phases of isolationism. This is not to say that the Chinese did not partake in these voyages themselves. After all, they did encounter the Swahili draft traders in India. This was also the era in which the famous voyages of Xing He took place. With that said, the Chinese and Swahili were both equally involved with these long distance trades which took place over 70 years prior to the voyages of Christopher Columbus and covered greater distances with larger and wilder animals aboard to care for. To this day, a genetic footprint of the Chinese can still be found in the inhabitants of the Lamu Archipelago, the same area where most Mtepe boats were traditionally manufactured. According to a study conducted by Nicholas Kristoff in 1999, he noticed that the inhabitants bore Asiatic features and claimed descent from sailors from a shipwrecked Chinese vessel, which was stranded on an island called Pate. Through DNA analysis, it was confirmed that these people did in fact have partial Chinese ancestry in their bloodlines. Arguably saving the best for last, and perhaps one of the most misunderstood types of sailors in African history, would be the Somali. In this day and age, the country of Somalia is associated with a corrupt, war-torn nation full of emaciated scavengers and pirates. This is further perpetuated by media portrayals of them in movies such as Black Hawk Down. However, Prior to the modern country that is recovering from the unapologetic effects of colonialism and illegal foreign fishing industries, Somalia was home to many thriving kingdoms that regularly engaged in maritime trade. With trade networks that were connected to the complex routes of the Swahili, similar patterns of growth and trade were observed by Somalian kingdoms. However, unlike the Swahili states, the Somali kingdoms have been known for their unmatched naval prowess throughout the centuries. Perhaps the greatest example of this was during the 1500s when the Portuguese exercised an aggressive policy on all cities of the East African coast. They would surround the relatively defenseless Swahili states with gunships and force them into submission under the threat of opening fire. They would then sack and plunder these cities for riches and place a Portuguese representative in place of their rulers in order to control all trade on their Indian Ocean ports. By the time they arrived in the territory of the Ajuran Empire of modern day Somalia in 1506, the typical patterns of plundering continued. The Portuguese looted and burned their capital city. However, unlike their Swahili counterparts, the Ajuran Empire was able to successfully defeat the Portuguese in the Battle of Barawa. With the Portuguese suffering nearly 20 times more casualties than the Ajuran army. This effectively prevented the Portuguese from establishing a permanent seat of power within Ajuran territory. After quickly recovering from the attack and rebuilding their city, the Ajuran military significantly increased its border and coastal defenses, 
arming them with telescopes and cannons to spot distant enemies and defend themselves from afar. By 1585, the Portuguese tried once more to establish control over Somalian trade. This time, they sent a fleet of 30 warships under the command of João de Sepúlveda to engage the Benadir region of the Algerian Empire from the safety of the sea, or so they thought it was safe. After the ships were spotted by coastal guards, the German naval commander Ahmed Diri deployed a fleet of ships to meet the Portuguese in full-on naval battle, effectively destroying every single Portuguese boat. The small number of Portuguese survivors were captured and taken into slavery. This was the second time in a row that the Portuguese were decisively defeated by the German Empire, and this time, they did not come back. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. I know it was a long video, but the history of Africa is rich and complex, but greatly misunderstood, especially in regards to maritime traditions. If you would like to discuss African history with myself or other like-minded individuals, feel free to hop in one of the text or voice channels of my community discord any time of the day, which I'll leave a link to in this description. Also, be sure to click that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed my video. And if you click the dislike button, please at least do me the courtesy of leaving me a comment explaining why. I always want to improve my content and your feedback really helps. Again, I hope you enjoyed the video and always remember, we don't come from nothing.